Welcome back to the Detect Crime series webinar presented by Serialize. In each episode, we examine one specific aspect of how crime series work, with a little help from the excellent scholars of the Detect project, practitioners in the field, and our own Serialize instructors. We write crime series for many reasons, but one is certainly because we want to say something about the world. Popular culture, when it's done right, is so much more than just pure diversion. It resonates when it touches on something that is relevant to both writers and viewers. Crime is endemic to society, but where does it come from? What does the existence of crime say about the world we live in? For this reason, crime series offer a great vehicle to reflect on the world we live in. How do we do that? Let's take a look at three strategies some practitioners have used to imbue their shows with a deeper meaning. Almost from the start, public service broadcasting in Europe has been conceived with the aim towards educating citizens. In the early years of public service television, this usually meant programming news and factual information shows on the one hand and edifying literary drama adaptations on the other. That changed with the advent of commercial advertising supported channels. Those networks were built on the ethos of obtaining high ratings for their advertisers and accordingly programmed appealing entertainment shows. Facing this competition, public service broadcasters in many European markets try to retain their audience by shifting their programming focus. The public service mandate was relegated to the news division, whereas the fictional programming division went full steam ahead with light entertainment programming. Today, many European public broadcasters have plastered their schedules with crime procedurals that are virtually indistinguishable from each other. Scandinavian public broadcasters went another way. In the late 1990s, Danish public service broadcaster DR also felt the pressure to compete with its new commercial rival TV2 in programming entertainment shows. However, DR's executive producer Sven Clausen did not give in to the impulse to go for simple comfort food. He came up with the idea of the double story and put that into practice with a police procedural that he was producing at the time, Unit 1. It was a way of trying to define and defend the need of public uh, service of, 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 of television. Um, and I recall vividly the, the first day I brought it to the discussion around the table during the weekly meeting at Danish Television Drama, saying, um, yesterday I was introduced to the new crime show, by the way, at the commercial channel TV2. I was very much entertained, but we, we are obliged to, to define ourselves by doing something more. And at that time, sort of late 90s, I defined it by saying tomorrow, Monday morning, uh, after our no, no, usual Sunday slot, Monday morning, I would like to read two articles in uh, the morning papers. One sort of the usual people um, making so, sort of a, a judgment of the show, the entertainment. But on the front page, I would like the political journalists to have a headline saying, we have something wrong in this society and we have to look after this subject. And therefore you see in the 32 episodes of unit one, we do, which are all based on a true story, on a true crime. Of course, more or less cover up, um, but we, we found stories which were able to put a, a question mark to something in society. And that's what I would call, so I, I call it the public service layer, which was later on sort of re, rephrased by head of drama of tell, saying the double story. But, but uh, the, the public service layer is my little, um, my little investment uh, into the yearly discussions um, with the politicians about the whether to, to, to sustain uh, the funding of um, the public broadcaster institutions. Sven Clausen and his writers found true crime cases and fictionalized them for Unit 1. 
In this way, he brought social issues to the forefront of people's minds. Yet these were not simple message films. As Billy Wilder said, if you want to send a message, write a telegram or a WhatsApp. Sven is no enemy to making engaging crime shows. He simply managed to find a good compromise between educating and entertaining his audiences. It's not that I'm trying to, to, uh, <laughs> to, to spoil every sort of entertaining thing, but we are talking about serious crime. We are quite often talking about murder. So I think we are allowed to bring in a second layer called the conscience of society. Sven explains that good TV entertainment functions on a dual mode of fascination and identification. TV dramas present us with characters, situations or world that fascinate because they are extraordinary and appealing. They give us insight into lives that are so much more exciting than our own. At the same time, we as viewers must be able to identify with the characters and relate to them. We understand their emotional struggles, whether they are the investigators, the suspects, the victims or the perpetrators, because those are our own struggles. We discussed the characters, the five leading characters in, in, uh, in Unit 1 and later on the three leading characters in The Protectors. We did it straight Hollywood way, whereas this character with all the girls, whom all the girls would um, cut out and put onto their walls, you know, um, we really did that. And uh, could we have a character which would attract uh, every woman of 50 years plus? And of course you can do that. And therefore, and thereby you use the identification with the character arch as uh, not, not necessarily a cover up, but, but as, as a helping stick, <laughs> um, a crotch uh, in order to achieve the in, in interest in uh, 50 minutes of entertainment. And, uh, and nobody, nobody will, will take offense um, that within that entertainment, there is a message. It actually might add to your hunger uh, for watching another episode because it wasn't an empty 50 minutes it was something which gave you something to think of. And most, most important, um, tomorrow at work, we want to discuss that because it brings us together. And, um, and we watched that show, all of us, uh, or some of us, and therefore we, have to, we must discuss, we must watch it every Sunday because we're going to discuss this Monday morning. And as we all know, we are very different. So I will not sympathize with the way that policemen handled that situation. It would have been totally different had it been a female police woman doing it. So, but you create that sort of discussion because on top, on top of the fascination, there is an identification. You don't discuss the car chase you don't discuss how well the stuntman jumped from the tower, but you discuss the subject matter of the dilemmas of the characters. DR maintained its relevance as a public service broadcaster by walking the fine line of programming highly engaging entertainment programs with social relevance. Crime shows such as Unit 1, The Eagle, The Protectors and The Killing, as well as political drama Borgen, became water cooler moments for the entire nation and incited a critical debate among viewers and social commentators. So one way to go is to use real-life crime cases and make them resonate with viewers through emotional storytelling. Another way is to choose a setting that is fraught with meaning. Klaus Zimmermann produced the Icelandic crime show Trapped, which became a hit in its native market and was exported to all over the world. Trapped is an arena-driven show. Much of the conflict comes out of the setting itself. In fact, it is the land that is at stake in the story. In season one, former Reykjavik police detective Andre Olafsson is chief of police in a remote fishing village in Iceland. One day, fishermen recover a mutilated corpse from the water just as the ferry from Denmark comes into harbor. Andre suspects that the murder occurred on board the ferry and he detains the crew and all the passengers just as the fierce winter storm cuts the village off from the mainland. At the end of the season, we find out that the murder is related to a larger 
political conspiracy inside the town, which involves selling off the harbor to foreign investors. Klaus Zimmermann acknowledges that after season one, the arena had yielded all the conflicts that were deemed possible. So if he wanted to keep the series going, he had to switch things up a bit. So you always try, I mean, the characters don't, they're not gypsies, so they stay in their location, but then they move into where the crime is. But mm -hmm. you try to find indeed different arenas because once you have, in, in, in season one, it was really the, we, we looked into that town with mm -hmm. a microscope and it was the explosion of that town that looked so peaceful. Basically, everybody had, you know, the corpse buried in their, in their mm -hmm. cellar. And you felt like, well, this is now done. The city, th this town is, is done. You know, there's, <laughs> there's mm -hmm. no more story to be told. Everybody's got a murder, is a murderer, etc. Everybody's either in prison or dead. So we decided to, in season two, to go up to the highlands where, Actually, there are a lot of um, big um, energy industries built because they 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 go deep into the earth where the where the where the lava is, and there's a, there's there's a lot of um, money for for the Icelandic government that that lies underneath, and 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 that's a big issue with mm. you know um, foreign workers with uh, land transactions and um, and ecological um, issues. So, so that was something we wanted to explore because this is also specifically Icelandic. Klaus looked for another arena within Iceland that was similarly fraught with tension. Exposing his main character to this new arena also challenged the character in new ways. For the upcoming third season, Klaus and the writers have yet again changed the setting. And again, it's the land that is being fought over. I would say the third season goes goes again into a very different uh, story but we actually managed to combine the story we're going to tell in season three with something that happened before season one which is the reason why our cop actually mm. went into exile into the small town in season one so we managed to bring the backstory into mm. the third season to close it basically and um and this time it's a it's a it's like a like a viking conqueror of iceland but the vikings this time are the bikers they come from denmark and um they will try to conquer iceland um not really conquer but but they will try to bring their drugs and install a drug mm. traffic uh situation and also because one of the guys is Icelandic, he comes to claim the land from his father because land, again, is very important in Iceland because it has such a huge value. And, um, and so it's about the land, it's about you know, who owns the, the land, and it's spiritually, it's um, the, the bikers who are uh, basically a bunch of thugs against um, a group which is a pagan group living also um, on the countryside and it's the confrontation between I would say good and evil. Here we see the characters, theme and arena closely interwoven with each other. Of course we will have to see how it all plays out since the third season of Trapped hasn't aired yet. But we can see how Klaus and the writers have really thought hard about how they want to bring contemporary social and political issues into the conversation. Of course, this only works if it's tied into a character that resonates with audiences. So for our third strategy for saying something profound, let's look at character and character development. In episode 7, we learned that the detective archetype has undergone a transformation from the centered and the decentered detectives to the norwise and the domesticated detectives. Detect scholar Caius Dobrescu has detected a second evolution in the character. He says that in the 1970s and the 1980s, there was a wave of crime writing that was imbued with the countercultural spirit of 1968. The archetype of the idealistic detective who fights against a corrupt political and social system from within showed up in films such as 1973's Serpico. 
But then, within the 1990s, a shift occurred in crime writing. Mainstream culture and counterculture were no longer in sharp contrast to each other. Similarly, the detective archetype evolved. The detective became less radical, less ideological. Things become more, well, complex and uh, they, they are not so easy uh, reducible to a, to a political agenda, let's say. Uh, and maybe the, the very structure of the, of the crime investigation helps in bringing nuances, you know, and, new, and, and angles to, um, the, uh, to, to, to the uh, revolution, the radical agenda that was initially, uh, you know, the lot of uh, new crime fiction. Yeah, because here you also have to bring surprise. You need to discover something to, uh, uh, you know, the perpetrator is not always, I mean, is never the one that you would expect. So uh, you inevitably have to call into question all sorts of um, social stereotypes and prejudice. Yeah. For instance, that the rich should always be guilty, you know, and this, uh, the, the rich capitalist and blah, blah. They are all, but, uh, you know, the structure itself uh, forces you to, to be more analytic and bring things in, in another perspective and, uh, you know, complexify all these, uh, um, uh, all these presuppositions, moral or ideological. In the crime genre, things are never as they appear. The crime investigation itself forces the detective and the viewer to come to terms with their own social and moral preconceptions. But Caius believes that the atmosphere has changed yet again in more recent crime dramas. He expects the ideological detective to make a comeback. The first sign of this can be seen in the Young Wallander series. This Netflix series reimagines the Kurt Wallander character from Henning Mankell's novels as a young man in today's Malmer. Henning Mankell's original character was an aging detective investigating crime cases in Ustad, a small town in southern Sweden. The old Wallander is divorced, overweight, has anger management issues, and drinks too much alcohol. Caio says that while the old Wallander had his heart in the right place, he showed no specific political agenda. In contrast, the young Wallander is conceived differently. While the young Wallander seems to me much more, well, politically correct. I mean, I don't mean it as a critique. I mean that he, he really seems closer to this idea of uh, you know, as someone who has a purity of thought and belief and who would really uh, challenge the, the, the system from, uh, from this position. Uh, somehow reminding the uh, uh, attitudes of, uh, well, as I said, uh, the, eight, uh, the 70s, the 80s of this moment of countercultural uh, crime, uh, crime fiction and, uh, and crime uh, movies. In the first season, we meet Kurt Wallander as a young beat cop in Malmö. When he witnesses a horrendous crime in the housing projects where he lives, he becomes personally committed to tracking down the perpetrators. The stakes rise further for him when the police detain his neighbor, a young immigrant with a promising football career. We put this question to the creator of Young Wallander, Ben Harris. Did he approach the show with a political agenda? I was not a very politically uh, engaged person really before like Brexit happened um, and it really kind of affected me quite a lot um, not just that it happened but the fact that for like half of the country that I grew up in um, bought it and basically bought into what was you know you can call it what you want but it's effectively selling xenophobia um, and not only that side of it but also that to me it's so clearly a sort of just a, a, a just a big lie it's just a way to get this done and a way to kind of appeal to the masses and you know and it and it I'm not saying that it has you know there are I'm not saying we're living under a fascist regime or anything but there are fascist regimes in the past that have harnessed the exact same thing in order to get their goals over the line um, and it really kind of affected me you know, I know I, I saw Sweden as a humanitarian superpower, just like I guess most people do. Um, and the idea that Sweden had a sort of far right, sort of UKIP esque party in the parliament, and that they were getting votes, significant votes in the election, and that you know 
there was kind of um, this gang war of sort of immigrant uh, gang going on in Malmö. Um, and it was all a symptom of the same. It, to me, it was like the West's kind of problem in microcosm um, was kind of all, you know, it was like a lightning rod for all of the stuff that we were going through in the UK um, under a sort of slightly posher <laughs> um, hat, perhaps. And, you know, the stuff that's happening in America, the same. And it just felt like it was a really um, apt crystallization of what's going on in the world. Ben crafted a similar awakening into the arc of his main character. Young Kurt starts off as a fresh-faced idealist who believes he really can make a difference as a police officer. But at the end of the season, he has become disillusioned and is ready to quit the police force. Even though Kurt was able to identify the real perpetrator behind this and a series of other murders, Kurt was unable to put this person behind bars. He has to realize that, indeed, the rich get away with murder. But Ben, also a teacher that Sierra lies, did not simply shape the character in order to vent his own political agenda. For him, the larger question was how to make this young man turn into the iconic character with whom many viewers and readers are so familiar. That was kind of the idea is that you sort of, as I said, like you take him kind of as far away as possible from the one you, you know. Um, firstly, you know, just sort of strategically to make the show stand on its own two feet, but also because, you know, if you want the guy to go on a big journey, you know, it, when you write a, a script, you know, and it, you've got um, even not even something like this, but just a character going on a journey, a sort of strategy, a sort of screenwriting strategy is to know where you end up and go, okay, well, how can I take my characters far away from that as I can to give them the biggest journey to go on? So when he set out to design the show with his writer's room, Ben started off with two images in his mind that would temple his entire first season. One was cut in this like high rise um, with people from all kind of ethnicities and it being very intense. You can hear music from the upstairs flat and you know that it was kind of, um, you know, urban living. And then I had this idea of like at the end of the season and it's very intense and claustrophobic, but then the, the following the case that the case by the end of the season, you would be out in the Swedish countryside in the beauty where there's no one for miles. Um, and it's like air to breathe and, you know, it's completely, it just feels like a completely different planet, but it's only, you know, an hour or two that way. In order to dovetail Kurt's emotional journey with the case and how to create this sense of injustice, because I also had the idea that, spoiler alert for those who haven't seen the show, but sort of had the idea that because in my back pocket, I knew that he's going to be a detective for the, for the next 30 years. That I'd love to end the season on him saying, I can't do this, I can't do it. Just because we know that you know, you're know you screwed, mate. Um, you know, to un really understand that it's taken that much from him, from him that he would say that. So I kind of knew that I wanted to get to that, that he would end the season saying, I can't do this anymore. And for that to happen, that there would be a big injustice um, that happened and it would be related to, you know, the sort of the underlying... My, the sort of observation that we we had was, you know, not a particularly groundbreaking one, but I think a very true one that, you know, the way that, you know, one of the things that really interested me is like as a, you know, a Brexit refugee myself, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, you know, the, the, the sort of immigration problem, um, immigration being kind of harnessed by, as a sort of convenient uh, sideshow to... What I, you know, my perception being that inequality is the sort of the real um, problem, um, you know, and that was kind of what I wanted to get to, and I, and I and I thought that Kurt would 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 land with Kurt's emotional journey with being that actually, how is it right that one family can have so much and all of these other people can have so little, and that the system was built in a way that it would never change. Um, and as depressing as that may be, I thought that was really, really good. So the main goal was to shape the character's emotional arc. The character makes a realization about the world, that an injustice can go unpunished even after it has been disclosed. That leads him from youthful idealism to hardened disillusionment. This only works if the audience can identify with the character and follow him on this emotional journey. The steps along the way have to be relatable. 
The question that you as the writer should therefore always ask yourself, how does this external action in the plot impact my character emotionally? In this way, character, crime, theme, and arena can be tied together in a neat, entertaining, and thought-provoking package. We're also organizing a contest for new original series ideas for either broadcast or streaming services. The proposed show should challenge and push the genre in un unexpected ways and use crime narratives to explore the richness and complexity of European societies. An international jury of top professionals from the broadcast and streaming industries will review the top five submissions. The winning author or team of authors will be invited to attend the DETECT final conference in Rome in June 2021 and meet the members of the jury. You can go to the link in the show notes of this episode to find out more about this contest.